this is only going to be about a 30 minute talk. So we should have plenty of time at the end for any kind of question, discussion, or whatever you want, everybody else wants to talk to after all of this. Um, and this is a project that I've worked on over the years and it keeps coming back. So th that's one of the reasons why I decided to bring this up with a marketing group. I've been in and out of marketing groups for the past few years and also worked in marketing research. And so a little bit about me. Um, I am a head of manager of analytics, data science at a, at a small bank in Boston. Um, I started out in chemistry and then got an MBA did a lot of work in the insurance industry doing some pretty exotic stuff. Um, got heavily involved in Monte Carlo and pricing um, and then got involved in quant banking and consulting. So I, I think as you can see, like every other data scientist, I just went the exact straight route out of college into data science. So what we're gonna talk about here is what, what this project is all about. Uh, and I'm gonna try to give it to you in a way so that you can take this to your, to your next pro, uh, marketing project. Um, talk a little bit about what good survey design is or what I think it is. Um, there's an interesting um, bit of intellectual property that the um, ability to work on called customer quotient. Uh, similar in a way to NPS, but also very different. Um, we'll look at some parameters and constraints, then getting involved in the machine learning part of how do you actually do machine learning with, with survey data. So, the role of this was how do you how do you take a survey because that's what a lot of people in marketing research do, and develop a segmentation engine out of it so that as people complete your survey, you can put them in the right segment for whatever and, and you can segments can be based on whatever. Um, in this case, this was a sort of a behavioral psychographic segmentation, which means it wasn't so much you bought product A, B, or you live in this part of the world or wherever. This is more about how you feel and how you behave. Um, and so it gives you a little different um, approach to sort of the different dimensions of marketing. Um, and it was looking to reveal, this is, again, this is a part of a much larger project, how people view companies, you know, and, and the other way to think about it is, it, at the end of the day, it rates how customer um, centric a company is, and that's how the that's how the questions were sort of phrased. So these are some of the things that I've learned about what makes a good survey, and these are just my these are my takeaways from from being involved in surveys and, and trying to apply machine learning and um, you know how do you get how do you ensure you get a lot of respondents, et cetera. So. The first thing is I want a goal of the, like, what is the survey to design to answer? Um, and then you're gonna wanna have some supporting questions. So I think of structurally, that's one way, that's how we wanna start it. Um, and the goal, you shouldn't have more than three things you're trying to answer. I usually say one to two is good, um, just in case, you know, you, you get, you pick up some other ancillary information. Um, and these goal statements are binary, so yes, no's. Um, my first experience was um, dealing with the survey and people were like, well, how likely are you to um, purchase from us again? And so you end up with these neutral, you know, everybody's in the neutral range and it doesn't really help you out. Or, or what do you do when you get a handful at the positive hand, and a handful at the negative and a handful at the neutral? Do you drop them? Do you include them in something else? So this sort of resolves that issue. It's a simple yes, no. Um, with that, the supporting questions you want as few as you can get away with, um, but still get the inf information that you want. So, you know, I like to think of maybe between five and 10 questions. Um, if you start getting over 10 questions, you're just getting too much, you're asking for too much information, and you'll find that people will drop out over time. Um, the flip side around it is in the marketing research world, you do have the ability to pay people with. Uh, pick your incentive, Amazon gift card, PayPal, whatever else, they will stay in for a longer, knowing that if they finish it, they'll get some money on, at the end. Um, and I've done a couple of the, I've done a, many of both. Uh, and it, there doesn't seem to be a difference in engagement as far as like, you get different answers if you pay people. Um, and then um, here's a key thing. 
I like my supporting question. So we got our we got our one binary. Like now, instead of what are, how likely are you for, to buy from me again? Is I I have bought from you again, or I will buy from you again? Yes or no? Um, and then we're going to ask a bunch of questions that support it. Um, and I think everybody's seen these strongly agree, agree, neutral, um, et cetera. I do not like that scale. Um, one, you don't get as much variability in the modeling phase. Um, whereas one to 10 gives you plenty of variability. And I think if you go over more than 10, people don't know what the numbers mean. Um, and just as a little aside, I worked in the wine industry for a while and you know they have their 100 point wine scale, but the funny thing is, 99 point whatever percentage of the wines are ranked between 80 and 100. So what they really have is a 20 point scale. Um, and so I don't know, they disguise it as a nine as a 100 point scale versus a 20 point scale. Same thing here. Um, 10 points will give you enough variability. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, people always say, oh, we can ask a question a different way to make sure that we don't have people gaming the system. Um, maybe if you get this giant survey that or like a personality test or something like that but that's a whole different animal here um if you're surveying your customers they're not gonna they're not gonna do the duplicates and if they start seeing the duplicates they're gonna be like this is a waste of time and it's also a waste of of your time too like every question matters um and i've seen some other indices out there where they have like uh they try to decompose like a net promoter score which into three indices and it's kind of like there the, the three indices are so incredibly correlated that you just wasted two questions every asking about the other two indices when they're they're like 90 percent correlated so it's kind of like you really have one in this um in the marketing world i know anybody's worked in marketing has heard of net promoter score it's kind of a hybrid because it because it does ask on a scale of one to 10, but you can also, but at the end of the day, you can make people binaries out of it. In fact, there is a, um, you know, people that score you um, nine and tens are your promoters, uh, six to eight are your neutrals and five and below are your um, detractors and, and the score only works with uh, promoters and detractors. So it's, it's a very unique um, scale, but when you do NPS, you, sh you should really ask, you know, get into the whys. Um, and then a, a good rule of thumb is to try to get about a thousand responses because um, you can do some really good modeling. I know everybody thinks, oh, this is a world of big data. I need 10,000, I need 100,000, I need a million. No, you don't. Um, you need a well-designed survey. And if you get close to a thousand responses, you will get a reasonable amount of information. Um, what's interesting about surveys is that if your questions are distinctive enough, then even if you get smaller segments, you will be able to predict them. So for instance, you know, if segment one is questions one through three, and then you know, segment two is maybe a question three and question four, but then segment three is this oddball question, question five. Even if it comes out small and you get into this highly imbalanced um, data scenario, the fact that question three, five is so unique, it will help even with the prediction in, in an imbalanced situation because it's not random. So a little bit about a customer quotient. This was developed by um, a colleague of mine at C Space in Boston, Dr. Manila Austin, and and it talks and it builds on this custom this sort of how customer centric is your company, and and they ask questions from from the customer's perspective, and and you build up the pyramid from you know relevance. You're, you're just in the game at that point. Um, then we have a customer series of questions around customer experience. How well do you do? Then the better you are, you get into openness. Uh, and that begins to really unlock the doors. Um, are you willing to have an honest and open two-way dialogue with your customers? Um, empathy is really the, what changes the game. So when, when, I, when I've seen companies in the segments um, it's not till you do reasonably well at the openness and get into empathy that you begin to really like we do grouped different um, companies and segments and everything else. And you see when you start rating up on the empathy score, you, you begin to run away um, and become extremely well. And the last one is what we call emotional validation. Those are the people out there that are selling your product on their recommendations. Um, 
we used to talk about is you have two people, you have three people having a conversation. Somebody says, I need to get a new um, smartphone. And the first person says, get an iPhone phone. And the other person really doesn't say anything. So your iPhone is your sort of emotional validation person. And they'll, they'll give you five reasons why you should get an iPhone. Or on the flip side, they'll give you five reasons why you should get an Android or whatever it is. But they are selling your product. And it's called emotional validation. Um, those are your ultimate customers because they are doing your marketing. Um, and we find that people that score higher up there actually have to spend less in marketing and advertisement over the long term. And it gives them better scores. So that's just a little bit of this intellectual property area in the space that I worked on here. Um, for those with traditional marketing backgrounds where you talk about the four P's and the three C's and all those. So the four P's, product price, place and promotion. Um, the three C's are customer, company and, and um, competition. And what these do is sort of map various questions that help with the um, CQ scoring, you know, into these different um, traditional marketing buckets so that like when we when we talked about pitching this to different companies, if I had a traditional marketer, I could say, yeah, this is, this is your product piece, this is your price piece. And you can see um, like price, um, it's all from that customer point of view. The company appreciates my loyalty. And that's literally how the question word, it's an action word or I don't feel ripped off. Um, and you can see in most of these questions, and these are sort of um, paraphrases of it, but we've we've made it action oriented, and it's from the customer standpoint, not I. Versus, if you see, think about a lot of surveys, is the company is asking, "Do you like us? You know, do we do a good job at this and things like that?" Whereas this whole framework really reverses it around. So let's talk about this, this project that we had. Client specification number one had to be built in Excel. And that happens, you know. I, I wish I could just do it in Markdown or something easy like that or a web app, but um, at the same time, is it's workable. Um, what it does do is it changes the model um, processing a little bit. You know, I'm not gonna be able to run XG boost or any of that. But at the same time, I may not need to. And, and there's a good way that I get around this down the road. Um, our sample size was 900, not 1,000, but that's fine. Um, and it's like, okay, we're probably only going to get about three or four segments out of this. And part of this came out of is that a major company was um, had a project with a major consulting company, and they said, well, you have eight eight distinctive segments. And it was like, OK, really? Um, so we're going to test out whether we really have eight distinctive behaviors um, by using this, this survey. Um, in the initial step, and, and this is one of the things that, like I said, um, this one did not have the dependent variable. Um, and that's, that's, why I want, that's why I added it in early on as a good survey has a binary outcome. So we had to create one or create some sort of segmentation outcome. The nice thing is survey questions on a one to 10 scale, easy to work with. Um, and if you think about it, if in the, from the machine learning world, as we go down the road, um, we're not gonna have to center scale or do any of that with the data. It's already prepackaged and on a one to 10 scale. Um, and, you know, we're good. Whether we do um, any kind of, and we're going to do unsupervised learning or supervised, you, you're not going to have to um, rescale all the data, which makes it, which makes it nice. Um, and when you do some of these things, and, and, and these end ones are, are, you know, my discussion with them, um, you know, what's good enough accuracy? Um, are there penalties for, you know, false positives or false negatives? Like if we put the person in the wrong segment, you know, how costly is it to your business? Um, and um, should we add penalties to if, if they are costly in one way or another? Um, and, and that would change a little bit of the modeling too. Um, we, would add, we would actually add a cost uh, matrix into it down the road if we had to. Uh, but in this case, there, there weren't too many big deals. And they said, you know what? You give me 80% of the way, you give me 80% of the right answers, I'll be happy. 
I was like, okay, 85, that's where I shoot for. Hopefully we can do better. That's one of the things for me is I, I always like to be in the 90s. Um, but sometimes it doesn't always work out that way. So here's a little road, road map here. And, and you can use this over and over. Like any, time, any kind of survey work you do, I've used this format for a lot of NPS modeling that I've done for various companies over time. Um, Design a nice survey. So we asked for, for NPS people, we ask that question, but then we ask them questions about customer service. We ask them questions about pricing, other aspects of the business um, to see what, what you're trying to do is figure out what drives that answer, what drives that yes, no. Um, so then we're going to do some clustering. I like hierarchical clustering. It's easy for visualization. The scale is easy. So we're going to um, separate our respondents into some different segments and clusters. Uh, and then we're going to create a, a dummy variable for each one. So, you, so right, you know, you're in segment one or you're not. You're in segment two, you're not. You're in segment three or you're not. Um, I think a lot of people would try to go straight to sort of a multinomial model. Hey, we're just going to predict what segment you're in right out of with one equation. Those require a lot of data. So yeah, if you're in the, one of these big data worlds and you've got 10,000 or 50,000, um, you could probably pull it off with a thousand simple binaries is going to be the way to go. So here's my little my little magic here. What what I first do is use the elastic net regression, um, the GlimNet model, the GlimNet package by um, Trevor Hassey, Rob Tipsheranian. Um, it was designed for genomics. It really will help you reduce dimensionality, um, and it's extremely fast. Um, and I, to, Give you a little bit of more information on this. Um, the people that are familiar with ridge or lasso regression, this is the hybrid. So a ridge will attempt to um, squeeze down all your coefficients to make them very small. Um, and the lasso will do is if there are multiple variables that are correlated, the lasso will pick one and leave the other ones out. Now the problem with the lasso regression is you don't know why it made the decision. Um, is it, you know, a function of the gradient descent or a function of the order of the data? You just don't know. Uh, and they talk about it in their paper um, about that. Whereas what the elastic net does is I have three variables that are correlated. If they're statistically valid, we leave them all, we leave all three in. If they're just not statistically valid, we pull them all out. Um, and so that's why it, how it gets to your um, dimensionality reduction. So then this last step is, all right, we, we got to go into Excel. Now, you probably could do an elastic net, uh, maybe not in Excel, but you can easily do a logistic regression. And so what we're going to do is uh, build out our template. So when we get batches of scores, we just run them through our uh, worksheet, worksheet with logistic regression in there, and then it's going to use a voting method, and it'll choose which segment you're in. So the first thing that is we run this, um, the elbow, famous elbow plot used for clustering. Uh, it's called within the, some of the squares residuals. Um, and so what you got is the number of clusters. They told me they had eight segments, so I went for up to eight clusters, or at least their consulting company did. And what we're looking for is the bend in the plot. And you can see, the, you get the elbow at about three or four, at which point then it all sort of flattens out. So um, if I had a lot more data, I probably would shoot for four clusters. Um, given that it was only 900 respondents, three would probably do the job. Um, you can see that the, the uh, some of the squares uh, goes down to obviously the most between one, two, and three. Between three and four, it's very little, and after that, it tails off. So that's why we're looking at that. Um, inflection point. Um, so when we plot them all out visually, we get three groups. Um, and this is, an, you know, you can see in the hierarchical clustering um, that you get the divisions almost fairly cleanly between the, the blue block and the green block, um, and then the green block and the red block. And the other way to interpret this is the people in the blue block are very different from the people in the 
red red segment, and there's some gradations across the middle. Um, I use this plot a lot when I do um, text analytics because it's really fun then. Because um, what you're seeing is when you do this with text, is these people are saying one thing, they're saying something similar to these guys, but now it's getting different, and then you get something really weird at the other end. Um, so I, I I like this plot from a visual standpoint, um, and the axis the other axis is sort of, is just the distance distance metric, um, and as I as I mentioned, because all of our questions were a one to ten scale, um, I didn't have to rescale anything um, to make to be able to do this clustering, and yep, this is small, and it may be difficult to predict, but it doesn't automatically mean that because as I said, if there are certain questions that are answered by a handful of people in the group, but that makes them marketably different, then you'll still be pretty good at predicting whether or not people are in there. So this is when I overlaid my cluster analysis across their eight segments, it was kind of interesting. I was like, well, you may have eight segments, but you have three distinct behaviors within each segment. And what I mean is that, you know, there is this grouping here. We'll, we'll call number one for now, behavior one. that seems to cut across all of them with an exception of, of these of this segment. And we, we also have behavior two. There's people in the in-betweens, but then this behavior number five stands out. Um, and it appears that this convenience store resellers segment is actually kind of small in general. Um, but looking at those numbers, it's pretty clear that we have, you know, you could describe it two different ways. You can say we have eight segments with three behaviors, or you could say I actually have 24 segments. So granted that I have this social couple, there are actually three forms of social couples. Um, now, one, one of the interesting things about looking at some of these segments is um, what about people that would be crossing over some of them? Like uh, how do they specific, how did the company specifically put them in each segment? And can you move or will you move over time? Like how long do you stay a new mom? Um, and, you know, how long do you stay a social couple? Some of these others are a little bit more static, but, um, we got a nice clean picture here, so it's good. We, we, our elbow plot told us we had three or four segments, and most likely three are hierarchical clustering, came up with about three segments, and we can see it here. Um, so the nice thing is, so we have three segments, three equations. So here's, here's a little bit more on the elastic net. Um, the reason why I use it is it's, it's going to give me my upper bound of performance or accuracy in this case. Um, we Because my goal is to get it down to a logistic regression with a couple of questions. Um, but if, if, if my last net commits, comes in only at 80% accurate on the rough before we even do any kind of dimensionality reduction, then my logistic regression isn't going to cross my 80% threshold. Um, so that's going to be problematic down down the road. Um, and the way it works is, you know, you think about your logistic regression. It's you're in segment one or not, you're in segment two or not, and the probability you're in, in segment three or not. And for each person, you get three scores and the highest score wins. So in this case, the person, this the data point came back, the probability in segment three was 90%. It beats 55, it beats 21. Therefore, they get assigned to segment three. Um, Versus, I think when you think about your traditional way of just using a single um, logistic regression, you generally assign your probability at 50%. And if it's greater than 50, it's in that segment. Um, but here we're using a little uh, uh, an ensembling type approach, and we're gonna we're gonna vote basically. Um, standard split training testing. So, you know, 900 data points gets me 250. Um, testing and, and you know 650 training. It's not great. It's not bad. Um, how do we do? 
So here's the first segment, segment number one, um, the lasting net regression, near perfect, um, very little um, false positives, false negatives, good split here. So it's not so unbalanced that basically it's an easy guess. Um, so this is nice, 99.26, really good. Um, and what, so you see down here, when we did these, see, I'm not going to sort of show you the same plot three different times. Um, and um, another key piece to look at is this, this no information rate, 0.61. That is essentially your data split. If the no information rate in this was 90 or 0 0.90 or something or higher than that, which when you get in, in balanced data sets, then that you know, that 90, 99, well, it's a good lift, but it's not as impressive versus we're at 60 on a random guess. And, you know, we're near 100% accurate. And you can see we got 94% on this segment too and 80 in the small segment. That's, and that's not surprising. We knew it was going to be a small segment. We knew it was going to be a little more challenging. Um, but it's still, for the client standpoint, they're quite happy with what they were seeing initially. This is a nice little variable importance plot with the um, elastic net model. And it's, you've got your questions ranked, order of importance. And when the, when the plot's out this way, that means they put you in the segment. Um, and you'll see in another plot, they go the other way. They're saying, when you answer this question, it kicks you out of the segment. Um, and now there's others, more sophisticated approaches out there. There's Lime. Um, that's probably the most common now that, that people are using uh, locally interpretable modeling. Um, but this, one of the things that tells me now is I can begin to remove some of the questions from this equation, right? What I'm trying to do is make is simplify this as much as possible. So I'm gonna say for segment one, we're just gonna use a couple of questions. So that now I only have three variables for this equation, perfectly easy, simple for it, especially since we don't have a lot of data. And so what did model one, what did question one, segment one say? Well, they appreciate my loyalty. I feel proud, sense of belonging, and they believe the company employees use their own products and service. So this is, we think the, um, the highly correlated to an emotional validation segment. Um, and so these are your, these are your really good customers. You want to take care, care of them. You want to know who these people are. Um, in the world of uh, computer vision, I was at a conference back when we used to go to those things um, in live person and someone said, they should, you should run your image recognition about at your customers when they come in your bank because you know, they match the face and the balance or something like that. It can come up and say, wow, this person's like a really big customer. You should do something to take care of them. Um, interesting portrayal, but you know, someone would say, yeah, but everybody's an important customer. I mean, they're just, just another way to think about how do you take care of your loyal customers and how do you show them their loyalty? And that's a, a question 16 is an important one. Um, and uh, I know when we were doing this, we were presenting something like this uh, to some internal people. Um, my marketing research person used the concept of Amazon Pantry. She's like, she said, they get it wrong all the time, but they make it right all the time. So. Yeah, maybe I order six things and five out of the six are, are right and one of them's wrong, but she said they always make it right. And I think that's that part of that. How do you get, you know, even if you mistake, make a mistake, how do you get people coming back to you? And it's all about, you know, fixing your errors um, as a marketer and as a company. So now, so when I reduce it down, and this is that what I said is we're going to go to a simple logistic regression with just a couple of questions. I lose a little bit of accuracy. So, um, so rather than almost a perfect with only one off in here, we've actually begun to make a little bit more um, false negatives or, or false positives here as we think they're in um, segment one where they're really not. Um, but we're still at 94%, so we're good. Um, and we're not, again, we got our no information rate. So it's, we got good lift. Uh, we now have a happy uh, logistic regression model for segment one. 
So segment two, as I said, looking at the variable importance, these, when you answer these questions a certain way, they actually pull you out of the segment. So you need them as a way to um, separate out segment one from segment two. Um, and if we ran this through Lime, you would actually see red and green. Well, if you use the traditional colors, you'll see red and green scoring for these questions that um, they're important because they will either put you in or put, push you out of the segment. Um, and these are a different set of questions we see. So um, our 16s and 21s, as you can see, are up here, not as important. And here we're imbalanced. And it's a mixed accuracy, right? So yeah, we think we're really good, but most of these people are getting pushed out in the other segment. Um, and this is the this is the logistic regression model for making, and that's where I said the no information rate is 90. We're getting a, a little bit more lift, not much. Um, and we're making equal errors, false positive, false negatives. Um, but we definitely have these questions that are oriented around customer service. And um, that's essentially what these uh, what these four questions point to. And then segment three, our small one. And this is why it's hard. You got some of the questions that kick you out of the segment and some of the questions that kick you in the segment. And there's a little bit of both. Um, so you think about it this way. In segment one, these guys were high scorers. So now in segment one, uh, in segment three, you're getting low scores on here, but now you're getting a different scoring across here. So these questions are pushing you in, in them into the segment. And the nice thing is we do okay at a small segment. No information, no information rate is 52%, almost, almost purely random, coin toss. Um, and we're able to beat that by almost 30 points, 78. So again, I, I mentioned it's like love it at 80%, love to hit 85. But um, at the same time, given that it's a coin toss um, and the data set, then at 80%, we're doing okay. And obviously, if I use a far more sophisticated model, we could probably do a little bit better, but it goes back to the constraints. The customer wanted it in Excel. They wanted to be able to batch load their own data um, and just kind of see the levers. And I think that's the other part of the importance of logistic regression. And, and same thing with the elastic net, it's just in a logistic regression with a regularization function is that a business person can say, yeah, if I score better with this question, Oh, I'm actually going to increase my my loyalty scores, or um, you know that that's partial uh, differential part where you say, and, and this is what I do when I do when I analyze surveys. I said, look, if you increase your score for this question by one point, the probability that they are one of your promoters or you know frequent buyers and everything goes up by five percent, and if you increase by two, it goes up. So it's it's a very uh, quantitative approach to being able to say, how much do I need to move the lever? Um, and I'll say in the NPS world, and, and I was doing this in my last company in healthcare, um, it was, it's a lot easier to make a person go from a detractor to a neutral than it is to take a neutral person to make them a promoter. Um, and so as you think about ranking your, your actions that you're gonna take, um, and, and so you're in, in this case, your dependent variable is their promoter or they're not, and you rank the questions of importance, it'll tell you what's driving their answers. Um, you should focus on ones that are the low hanging fruit, but they're also easy to get them out of the detractor hole. Um, and that's why actually we did that in, in a couple of places and it worked, right? Like our executives actually had in their bonus plan that they had their NPS had to go up by four or five points. Um, and this actually created a, a bit of a, an action plan for them. So what did we do here? So we started out with our elastic net. We got the question, we got the survey down from 17 to nine questions. That's good. Um, obviously the elastic net is very good. We, I, I looked at, and I didn't show these here, but we looked at CV. 
um, RC curves, confusion matrix. I showed you confusion matrices just so we could get the, the few extra stats out of there. Um, we have a model for each segment. We use our voting approach. Overall, the overall accuracy was eight, it was over 85%. Um, and they said that was the client said it was acceptable, and um, they didn't have any. We, we didn't have to come up with penalties for misclassification, um, making a, a false positive or a false negative on a segment is, from a marketer's standpoint, it's not the end of the world. Maybe if you're spending lots and lots of money um, on something, it, it may become more important. But in this case, it was really looking to understand what's going on within their customer segments. And that's it. Um, this, so this, so if we look at it, you can take a survey, make a binary question out of it, apply clustering. Maybe you like K and N better than hierarchical or something like that. Um, get your segment labels and then apply some machine learning against it. And if you get about a thousand respondents, as you've seen here, even with nine hundred. It'd be reasonably accurate, and, and you can do this to all any survey. And, and this is just I do this on a regular basis over and over with different surveys, try to um, tease out some really good um, quantitative aspects of it. Awesome, thank you so much, Brian. I, I see there's a few questions that are starting to come in right now on Slido, um, but just want to let people know if you want to unmute yourself or raise your hand on, on Zoom. You could ask questions live too. Lee, I, I see you had asked a question earlier in the Zoom chat um, to Brian. I believe it said, do you reverse code uh, or any other item types? Would you want to add any other context to that question? Can you hear me okay? Yep, I can. So earlier when you were talking about item types, you talked about liquor scales and 10-point uh, scales and all that. Um, I'm wondering if you use any reverse coding or Thurstone type items to make sure people just aren't repeatedly filling out the same value over and over when you do your assessments. I don't like to do that. I, we used to have a large, um, I used to have large conversations with people, not so much reverse coding, but they call them straight liners, which I think is what you're getting at. You know, somebody um they give everything a five or everything you know whatever it is um i look at it i don't want to throw it out because especially with a likert scale um it's a uh, you don't know that could that could be a very valid data point um 10 point scale you send you tend to see a lot less straight what they would call straight lining but it's in the it's always part of the EDA, and just because we used to have that conversation all the time. Thanks, Brian. Um, I can read some of the anonymous questions, but again, if you want to use Slido too, you can put your name in there and you can ask it live as well. Um, but the first one was, how are the surveys conducted and collected? I've noticed YouTube does surveys in between videos. How did you so do these? The, this survey was done um, through a marketing research platform. Um, our same, th actually, most of them were done that way. So when I, um, so like I said, this one is through a marketing research platform. I don't know who you are, um, and you just plug it away, and then we get it out on the back end. I think like Survey Monkey and something like that. I've done this exact same analysis with data from SurveyMonkey also. Uh, it, that was on um, uh, InsureTech in, industry. We did um, about 2,000 respondents from all from different groups. Um, and some of them are, are just, a lot of them are generally web-based where um, you've, you've had a transaction just like you say on YouTube, you know, Hey, how did you find this video? You know, give us a rating one to ten. Or um, uh, sometimes, you know, you'll get a note at the end of this call. You'll be asked to take a survey. Um, and my, the healthcare company that I worked for had it that way too. So, um, which was interesting because now you're 
punching in numbers on a phone. Um, you can still do one to 10. It just, it's a little different than um, clicking a box and you don't get comments as much. So then you, you have to ask uh, good questions, detailed questions. I was curious if, if you don't know who is answering the survey and then you're going and making changes through the business, how do you measure like what actually made that change in the survey or, or if it was like those actual customers or? Uh, most of them, most of these types are directed at, at, your, at your customers. So you, so you know your, your customers. Um, and in fact, I did one recently at, at our bank. Um, it was a survey and so we had all their information um, and it was actually a rerun of a service. So they ran a couple of years, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, wanted to see what was going on. Um, but it was highly skewed by the age of the respondent. And, and, you know, you just have to point that out. Like, you know, you, you know I, I'd actually show a slide to our president to say, look, this is our real customer base. This is what they look like. This is what our respondent group looks like by age and demographics. They are different. They're not really speaking for our 100% base, but we will, like one of them was to pull the, pull the older segment out and then compare the different segments. Um, but yeah, you, so you generally try, well, you, you wanna know if they're customers or not. So that's, that's always an intro question. Um, or, you know, obviously if it's coming through your own platform, um, then you know whether they're a customer or not. Um, but you, if you can get demographic data on people, highly recommended to do it if they're if they're willing to you know ask just a couple questions um at the end because it can be important just like i said with our ours was a kind of a technology-based survey so age matters thank you um a few other uh, anonymous questions in slido and, and one is what distance metric are you using are you using for the hierarchical clustering i use good old euclidean distance um, so think about, uh, a matrix where we have 10, 10 columns and we're just going to, you know, calculate, square the distance between, um, along all those questions. So it's, it's very, very standard, very clean. Um, and because everybody was a one to 10, so I didn't have to like scale some, scale them all down. Like for instance, if, if you're looking at web, web data, and you've got bounce rate and page views, you can't do hierarchical clustering with that because page views is going to be in the thousands and bounce rate is going to be as a percentage. So you'll have to convert those so that they're an apples to apples type metric. These are all zero to, zero to 10. Don't really have to do too much for that. Thank you. Uh, Lucinda, I see you asked a great question on Slido. Is it okay if I pass the mic over to you to ask that? Yeah, sure. That'd be good. Um, so I saw that you, hi, Brian, how are you doing? First of all, yeah. um, I, I saw that you uh, were using uh, logistical regression for these, which I think is a linear based type um, model. But yeah. I was wondering if you've ever tried, and I know not for this one, because you can't do random forest in Excel, um, but can have you used uh, random forest or other ones that are, that deal with nonlinear relationships well and if, if you have like what's have you found that there's a find other find out other things i have not for this kind of stuff but i have and and what i um what i was doing a lot of work in the insurance industry uh if you talk to actuaries that's all they want to do is use um glm models of some form linear um and so i showed them a standard data set of if you think about age and income right is is the older you get you were supposed to have more income but you often see it is like a, a u or a non-linear almost like a bathtub where you've got people that are very young that have a high income then it goes down and then it goes back up and there's so many um we see that a lot of times in the insurance industry age of a house you know and so the short of it is the naive bays actually does a nice job 
mm-hmm. and capturing the and, and that was the plot I used to hold up to these people. I said, here's a problem with your generalized linear model all the time. And you're gonna miss this every time. Um, random forest is a good one too. It's a little harder to explain, and I think that that that's where it starts to get challenging. Um, In what sense is it harder to explain? Because you see, you have you have uh, the the uh, the feature importance. That's how I use it. I use feature importance as my list of things to pay attention to. Yeah, it is. It, it is. Um, so I, so I, I I like it that way, but I also try to get into this. Um, cause then they, cause they'll ask me, well, how much do I got to increase my score by? Um, it, and, and that was, that's what, that's when the advantage of using a linear model, if you can, you can't always, but, and I was able to say, look, you get the score by about five points, you, you'll be much better off. Or, or you only need to actually, with a lot of this stuff, it's like, you'll see the difference between like a, a six and a half and a seven. It's like, you only need to get your average up a half a point to get more people over the line. Um, and that's where it becomes really useful is that sort of marginal calculation. But if it's just like, what do I need to fix? Then I think, then I agree with you hundred percent. Like, especially in a more accurate, like you'll obviously probably be more accurate with a random force model. And then you can, then, then you can just say, Hey, th- this is my problem area. It's pretty clear. And that's what you focus on. And then that's what you have you know, team members and subject experts um, there to do. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Huge fan of all that you share with us. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Lucinda. Uh, A few other anonymous ones. One was, how big should the sample be to get good results? My rule of thumb is a thousand. And the reason why is because I've seen some I remember calculating some stat for logistic regression. And it's like you need a minimum for one variable at 100, maybe 200. So you think about, well, if I'm going to have three variables. I'm going to be in the five, 600 range. I'm going to start splitting. But, you know, you got to be in the 1,000 range um, to, to, get, uh, to get some decent results. And it's come through so many times. Like this, this t- survey had 900. I did NPS with 1,200, 1,000, 1,400, and I've been lucky to do surveys with 2,000. And um, the nice thing is it doesn't take tens of thousands, I, I think is, is, is a good answer. But if you can get 1,000, sometimes it, it just may take you more time, though. Um, and that was a conversation I would have with leadership is, you know, we're going to have to run this several months until you're going to get an answer that's usable. And you just have to understand this is the this is the rate of answers we're getting, and we need X amount. And as long as you explain that up front, I think most people are, are reasonable to work with on it. I wonder how that differs by like industry or I mean the types of surveys that people are doing and curious to like hear from everybody here as well if you want to chime in or share info in the chat too. I would say the more questions that you have, the more data you're gonna need. Mm-hmm. Um, um, someone had asked, could you clarify the survey design? Are we talking about three binary main questions and several one to 10 scale supporting mm-hmm. questions? No, so the survey was just, Seven, I think it was 17, yeah, 17 one to 10 questions. We didn't have, we didn't have a binary. Um, over time, I actually got them to introduce a binary into it. Um, and so that was why we had to do the unsupervised learning is to say, given these 17 questions, can I find s- s- some groupings? In which case we could find three groupings that are made up by how people respond to different questions different questions and we can see that one was customer loyalty, one was um, customer service and I think the other one was emotional validation. So, or value, sorry, value, uh, loyalty and service. Um, and that's, um, but yeah, like I always tell people, if you're doing a generic survey, you wanna know something about them, please have a binary question, even if, 
um, I had a good experience with this company, yes, no. Like, because <laughs> um, then you can actually use, again, those questions, those supporting questions are your variables to whether or not they say yes or no. Uh, and that's why I, I want to, you want to keep it that way. That's really helpful. Um, when making the model, is there a difference in setting the response variable as an ordered factor or a non-ordered factor? Uh, in this case, it doesn't matter because it's just a binary. Um, it's the one or zero. Um, and for both the elastic net package and I think if I used carrot for this too back then, um, it just has to be a factor. That's it. So your dependent has to be a factor and that's it. And it runs cleanly. This is all done in R. So um, I can't remember if Python requires that or not. I think it can handle a one zero as a, as a standard numeric. A few other questions, but I did, all, in case people have to jump at the top of the hour, I did also want to let everyone know that we've made a um, chat marketing channel on the R for Data Science Slack community. And so I think it's a great place to go to connect with each other too, or if you have follow-up questions as well. So I just want to point that out before I forget to do so, but I'll put the link to join in the chat. And then the channel is just chat-marketing. Um, but back to questions. <laughs> One was for bank satisfaction scores, is there a trend by community between historic issue, issues such as predatory lending practices and current satisfaction rates? And if anyone has to add any other context, feel free to jump in too. I, I'll say I don't under, not understand fully that question, but I will say I read a JP Morgan report out uh, when did it come out? December of 2020. So at the end, in, in December 2020, and it basically showed that um, smaller regional banks had a way much higher satisfaction than the national banks. And part of it was due to the pandemic in that when they did the whole CARES program and the loans, I don't know if anybody remembers all that, when, when the, the payment protection plan loans were coming out so that you could keep your employees, um, most of the big banks didn't, you know, didn't really step up for their, for their customers, whereas the, all the regional players um, really jumped in and, and, and did a lot of loans. I mean, our, my bank is quite small and we processed almost 10,000 loans between the two programs. And, I think it was a total of almost one and a half billion dollars worth for you know small local businesses to keep their employees on the payrolls and a lot of more like small restaurants and small you know just really small businesses getting twenty five thousand or or fifty thousand or whatever and and then the SBA once um, would forgive it um, and, the, and the whole program but that was the whole CARES program so that's the only thing I've seen um, so satisfaction scores are generally better for smaller banks is um, the uh, I don't have any insight into the predatory lending uh, part of that question. Thanks, Brian. Someone else had asked, does your experience with survey design come from any specific texts or purely from implicit knowledge and career experience? Uh, mostly from career experience. So I started out um, working in a marketing research firm that I mean, we would issue thousands of surveys a year. That was, that was how they operated. Um, and what I initially found out is that um, they're just leaving so much on the table because of that. Uh, you know, you, you get a lot of, in, a, in old school marketing was, what was top box? You know, percentage top box, bottom box. But I was like, that, that's not, you can do better. We can do better. Uh, and so with this original, original, data set that the CQ stuff that underlines underlined a lot of this that created the survey and everything. I was lucky, I mean, I, we had 100,000 responses to work from. Um, this specific data set alone after we developed the CQ was 900, but, um, and then they kept rerunning it. So it was growing. Um, 
but it's just, I think it's part of it. I, I've been in this marketing type role. So I had a marketing research role, did the quant shop for them, created one from scratch. And then I found that th this approach I've taken out of three other places and done, done the same thing, mostly around NPS modeling. And it, it worked. Like we did the logistic regressions for an insurance company. And it said, you know, here's problem A, B, C. And that's what they did. They worked on problem A. And then we took the survey a quarter later and problem A was now no longer problem A. It was, it had been cured. And actually the, the uh, NPS score went up three and a half points. And of course, everybody's quite happy because you know, you meet a major KPI for your uh, uh, unit performance. Everybody, everybody's happy then. Um, so it's part of it is it just works. Um, I know we just at the top of the hour, but we have two more questions. If that's okay, or do you have to sure. run? Okay. Um, someone asked, do you have any go-to resource recommendations? On what? <laughs> um, I'm assuming for survey design, but I'd also be curious to ask the audience here as well if if you have really helpful resources or also maybe specific packages that have, are helpful in the marketing space. So I have not found a good uh, survey design text. Um, in fact, we even had a class. I had a class on it, marketing research, and I disagreed with the instructor, so that didn't really go so well. Um, but uh, the, for packages, the Glidnet package out there, there is a great paper um, by Rob Tipsheradi and, and Trevor Hasty on it, and explains um, how it's different from original SO. And I think for me, I've, I think I've read that paper five times, um, just because I, I want to know it inside and out. Um, this was all standard, like this is simple code, really. That's why I didn't want to get into um, a lot of coding. I mean, Carrot, Glimnet, if you and understanding um, uh, the, the den extend package is extremely helpful. I'm, I've sort of mastered that now um, as far as being able to do it for anything. Like I said, I do it. I use that denigram for text analytics all the time. Um, and it's been a lot of fun, actually. So the Den Extend package shows you how to color any which way you want, size it all up, flip it horizontal, left, right. Um, and uh, I find it extremely useful in text analytics visualizations when you're comparing groups. Um, those are the, probably the three best ones there. I wish, I wish I had better marketing survey information. And I think part of it is there's just not that much out there. Um, which is why I've sort of created my own uh, page on what I think makes a good survey. And, and I still clash with, with people in CX all the time and they, they disagree with me and I, and you know, that's fine. That's, that's what we're professionals about. But um, if I, if I'm going to analyze a survey and I get my say, that's what I ask for. I ask for one to tens and I ask for binaries. <laughs> Thank you. One last question was, so I guess as you're designing this survey then, how are des surveys designed to ensure they are actually completed? For example, how many questions are too much before someone just gives up? We found between five and 10. Um, and closer to five is better. So in this case, we got from 17 to nine, so we got a 50% reduction. Um, in longer surveys, you're going to have to pay people. Like, that's just the way it is. Um, the insurance industry one we had to, and I can't remember how much uh, they paid for it. But um, yeah, they, after five, people will get, especially for a simple, like, how did we do kind of thing. You've only got maybe three questions before they're going to disappear on you. Um, so make that's why I said, make them count. Don't, don't. Um, make them overlap at all. Uh, you're not trying to spot the person that's trying to game the system. You really want to get in a short period of time, how much information can you get from people? Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian, for sharing this presentation with us and just answering all these questions as well. I don't see any other that have gone unanswered. 
but I also just oh. want to open it up to anybody to unmute themselves or raise your hand if there's anything we've missed. Thank you.